I may be the only person uh, in the building here that probably doesn't need a microphone, but <coughs> I, may, uh, I may use it. I've got a pretty loud voice. Um, so I am at 3.30, so I've lost two and a half minutes, but we'll get started. And uh, so there you go. Um, so I, I, I've been on kind of an interesting journey with Mars Society. I actually came up with the idea for the abstract before I became a volunteer and a member of Mars Society. And so one of the reasons that I wanted to write this is because as a fiction writer, I was having a hard time teaching myself about the uh, reality of... We can't record you without the microphone. Oh, you can't. Okay. All right, back to the podium. Yeah, you know, it's just it's recorded. Oh, wait, there is a lot of here. Yeah, the, the mic is the one that's hooked up. So, this so, so, nice. Yeah, that one. All right, well, recorded one. I'll just have to stand still. I like to fidget, so you guys are out of that. You can so, take it out of the stand if you want. What's that? You can take it out of the stand if you want. No, I'll probably drop it then. So, um, anyway, let me introduce myself uh, properly, but the title of this is Enabling the Creative Artist and how we can uh, ensure that the next generation um, gets more excited about Mars. So, uh, a little bit of background about me. Uh, I'm the Deputy Director of Education for Mars Society and have been since about April. i um, pretty active member. I'm also direct, the Director of the Youth Rover Challenge, so if you're attending the STEM event, you'll actually see some of the things that uh, I've invested time in, and Nicole and I have invested time in, into bringing sort of a robotics Lego program to sort of a real Mars objective, uh, which is kind of exciting. I'm also the host of Red Planet Radio, so if you've gone on the uh, uh, Mars Society website, you can play the podcast. Uh, my apologies because the last show was an hour and 15 minutes, but uh, we were talking to Jim Rice, who's an astrogeologist, and he was talking a lot about some very interesting things, so instead of keeping the show format to the 15 minutes that I normally would, I just let it run. So, uh, in any case, um, I am an active creative writer and uh, came from the television industry. I also designed websites, so uh, kind of a, a jack of all trades master of nothing, and uh, in my day job, I'm a technology consultant, so what's very interesting about that is um, being so heavily involved in very complicated conversations, the one thing that actually helps to get things done is by simplifying it and bringing, bringing it to a level of storytelling, right? Because the simpler things are, the, the more relevant people can understand, you know, the, the more relevant the story, the, the easier it is to understand. Um, complicated uh, conversations. And, and the other reason that uh, I'm invested in, in trying to give as much back to youth is because I have six children, and I always put this up there because this is what people always say to me when you have six kids, they you know the cost of that, right? So there's a picture of all of them. But uh, it's kind of funny, when you have one kid, two, three, they all tell you congratulations. When you get to four, five, six, they look at you like you're crazy. So uh, my agenda topics today, um, I'll tell you about why I think docudrama would work. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the, the challenges that I think we face in using that as a genre, <clears throat> whether it's in television, in, in film, in creative writing, in publishing, um, and, and how uh, there's ways that we can fix it. So I've come up with sort of a goal and some objectives to really stay on point. Um, I'm going to use some film title examples that I brought with that I thought are, uh, if you've seen them or not, most of you have probably seen the ones that I'll show you. The ones that uh, I think represent docudrama in a very good and positive light, and then ones that I think have kind of a touch base in science fiction and a little bit in reality and don't have such a positive spin. And then I'll talk a little bit about where we can begin to fix the problem and what you can do to help. So first, um, and it's funny, I actually had a different quote, but I was at an Oracle conference in Manhattan uh, on Tuesday, and I actually saw this on a technology slide. Uh, which is interesting because it was about the concepts of big data and what technology is sort of doing for mankind. And it was that imagination is more important than knowledge, which I have found to be incredibly true in my career because even though I have a very deep um, expertise in the IT and in the data and analytics industry, um, being creative and being imaginative seems to accomplish a lot more, especially when you want to communicate a rel relatively complex idea to other people that may not know anything of what you're talking about. 
So why docudrama and why Mars? Well, again, I, I kind of embarked on this. Um, as a creative writer, I wanted to go back for my master's in, in creative writing. I was a fiction writing minor in college and a television producer before I got into business. And I had to pick a concept. And at the time, I was very much into astronomy. And I didn't really want to write a science fiction novel. I wanted to write um, about something that would help to tell a story that could possibly come true. And then I kind of stumbled upon all of these different definitions of genres that are out there. And what I found is the term docudrama and a lot of the titles and, and creative works of art that are out there that sort of replicate reality with an emotional twist is something that uh, younger generations, and, and, and in many cases all of us, can really sort of understand and translate with. So the official sort of definition of it is a genre that attempts to capture reality and add sort of a human element to it, right? So if you think of movies like Titanic, right? We all went to that movie, we know that the boat sank, right? But it's being in that movie, and I remember going with my wife, and I'll, I'll be honest, I was in tears by the end of that movie. And so you remember those elements because of, you know, the biological processes of adrenaline and attachment, all those things happen in the movie so you don't forget them, right? And I think James Cameron being, um, you know, a, a, a shipwreck fanatic and doing all those things that he does, he wanted to be able to make that a story that people would remember. And he spent, if I'm not mistaken, it was in 1997, I think it was the most amount of money ever spent on a film production. So uh, it is increasing in popularity, and I, I mean, I can share a thousand examples with you, but if you just put in docudrama on Wikipedia, it'll bring up literally thousands of titles. They go back in mostly the last 50 to 60 years, so it's, it's kind of a new way to tell a story. And then for me, personally, why should, why should we do docudrama about Mars? Well, I mean, obviously we're at the Mars Society Conference. But for me, I think, you know, young people need to see that there is a positive, tangible, hard to get to place that's gonna require that human courage and, and uh, knowledge and skills. And you know, if you remember when Kennedy said the reason that we're going to the moon is not because it's easy, it's because we're hard. I think that's a really powerful story. With six children in my home ages, 12 to eight months, um, before I really got into this and they knew anything about Mars, I started to ask them questions open-ended ones like, what do you think about Mars, or what do you know about Mars, and they go to Naperville schools, right, so these are, you know, the top, top ten school systems in the country, and the, the feedback that you get is mostly that it's like, you know, I mean, if you ask a ten-year-old, well, it's, you can't live there, it's, a, and it's, a, it's an ice ball in the sky, it's, it's a desert, you know, all those kinds of things, but nothing really positive coming out of it. That 20? <laughs> So that's, that's why I thought uh, Mars would be a, a great reason. So again, that's why I'm, I'm here. But challenges faced. Um, so popular fiction, in my opinion, has created a pretty big problem for us. Right? Um, some of you are going to agree, some of you are going to disagree on that. And the reason is, is because everything is about aliens and zombies and apocalypses. So if you look at anything that really has to do with science or space travel, uh, or even just films in general, I mean, look at Elysium, right? That was probably, it's, it's about space travel, it's about getting off Earth, but it's because it's, it's showing the difference between rich and poor and so forth. Mm -hmm. None of it really feels great, right? But there are films that feel great. So my whole contention here is that I think that if we can influence and help people that are in the creative arts to understand why Mars is important and be able to learn about it without having to spend thousands of hours on research, to get it right, that we're going to start to see more written about Mars, and we're going to start to see more of a positive picture, and hopefully start to influence younger generations with that. Um, this is another thing that's interesting to me as, as somebody who spent a lot of time researching, and that's how I ended up at Mars Society, is that um, there are so many programs going on. I mean, I see presentations here from people that I've never heard from, and I've been you know, intimately involved on a daily basis our society, so even I'm still learning, but if I'm walking off the street into here, or if I'm someone who wants to learn about Mars from the get-go, I'm going to check out NASA, I might look at ESA, I might have heard of Mars One, but there's so many, you know, Mars Inspiration, there's so many other things that are happening, 
and there's no real central repository for it. So I say that's one of the things that we continue to do is to be able to create the ability for that. And then there is the one minor challenging detail, which I think one of the previous speakers kind of alluded to when we were talking about um, Amar's homestead, is that uh, this hasn't yet happened, right? So how do you write a document fiction about something that hasn't happened? Titanic's easy. There's history books, there's pictures, there's a boat, right? But we haven't gone to Mars yet. But we know, for, for the most part, that the technologies that we would use if we were going to leave in the next 20 years are relatively within reach. I mean, that's what the whole room next door is about. So if you can equip those creative minds with a way to understand what goes into that, I mean, even just the simplicity of if it's 30% Earth's gravity, what does that mean just for telling a story in daily life? If you drop something heavy, it doesn't break your toe because it's a third of the weight. You know, there's just things that you don't realize if you're not doing all the research. And I, and I think the research is a little too hard to get to in my opinion. So, um, my goal is to enable a path for um, artistic culture to uh, feel enticed and excited about how humans will reach our next destination, which I believe will be Mars. So, uh, three objectives to help sort of support that and to try to solve these challenges and problems. One is I think that, I mean, just as a society, but as it, depending on the type of job or where you're involved, to try to foster enthusiasm for where there are topics about literature, film, and visual arts. I mean, there's books out in the hallway here that I've never heard of. Um, and so, if I'm, and I speak to teachers a lot of times, and they ask me for where I get my information, you know, so just, just having a list of books or having things that you can recommend, right? Because how we learn is how other, is when other people share things with us. Or if you find something interesting on Facebook, I mean, there's little odds and ends that all of us can kind of do. So I say that if we can continue to foster enthusiasm, that will certainly help. Uh, to encourage positioning of a more of a reality base for the types of stories that we create and what artists create rather than what I call shock fiction or fear. And I'll go through some of those titles because I think that that really sort of helps to apply a more positive spin on things. And then make the category research easier. So build a central repository, school curriculums, and enablement uh, to be able to get all of this in the hands of the right people. So I'll give you some examples of uh, the, the docudramas that are popular films. I'm not going to show you other categories like television or, or written literature, but Titanic is the one that I've mentioned. Obviously, you guys know the story with that one. Apollo 13 was a very good story. I thought it was well made. It had the right cast. Um, it had the right mix of sort of what I'll say in-space film and then on the ground. So you kind of got the whole feel. And when I saw that film, I wasn't as much of a space enthusiast. So I felt like I walked away really understanding what really sort of happened. Now, of course, they add color, but that's the idea of putting the fictional aspect to uh, or just, you know, a real story. And then, of course, another one, which is the Facebook story. So if you actually talk to Mark Zuckerberg, he'll say that there's a lot of things in that film that aren't necessarily correct. Well, it wasn't a documentary. It was a fictional documentary or docudrama, right? So that's the concept. Here's the ones that sort of unsell me. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm incredibly entertained by these films. But when my children watch these, I don't really get the feeling that they're understanding what's possible, right? So Prometheus, has anyone seen that film? Okay, I'm thinking we're all kind of space junkies, right? So the whole part of getting to the point where they find this hidden cavern and they're exploring is really cool. And then suddenly there's snakes crawling in, inside of everyone's guts and everyone's gonna die and arms are getting chopped off. And I understand, there's always a place for it. But I would feel better when I go to bed at night if there was an alternative to showing what's going on in space. Now, maybe there are crazy flesh-eating worms somewhere. Uh, maybe that's a curiosity to tell us about. But the bottom line is, um, you know, what effect is that having? Well, think of it. Children are thinking, well, if I go into space and there's crazy aliens that are going to eat me, I don't want to be an astronaut. I mean, there's no, I mean, what's the, what's the great part about that? So that was a 2012 film. Another one. Uh, that came out very recently, which I really liked. I loved it, actually. I, I rented it at a hotel before it was released in theaters. It's only been out like a month, which is a um, Europa Report. So if you guys don't know this one, this is where they go to uh, uh, Europa. And uh, you know, it's the whole concept of, the, there was a proposed 2018 mission at one point I saw and read somewhere 
They're going to you know, drill a hole in the ice and drop in a probe and see if anything lives in the oceans of Europa. And of course, the film is um, interesting enough because it shows you sort of the claustrophobic feeling of being in a what is supposed to be a six-month mission, and it's kind of done in a mockumentary format. But again, at the end of the film, everybody dies. There, you know, there's an alien that eats people. I mean, it's just one of those things where, like, it gets me so excited about what looks like could be someone telling a good story about what space travel could be like and the things that are faced, and then they're facing, you know, metal octopus at the end. So, again, great film, but um, what does it leave behind? Uh, and then, of course, Elysium, which is now out in theaters. You can probably go down a block and a half or what have you and see it. Uh, fantastic Matt Damon movie, Jodie Foster. It's, uh, you know, it probably addresses some of the concerns of the things that we're all facing now. It's based in 2154, I believe. But here again, it's the difference between rich and poor. People are living in the sky. Everyone else on Earth is forgotten about. And now it makes, you know, going into space seem like something that we need to do to escape the problems that we Again, not a real positive spin for kids that are going to have to go through chemistry and math class as to you know, why they should be giving back to the community. So to solve that, I thought that I could say at least three ingredients that would be good that were in other films that I think would be a good format for, for future documentation. One is a reality injection. So you're going to see me use the title that I just complained about, which is your Oak Report. I say 95% of that film had elements in it that very much sort of reproduced what it could be like. Um, to be in space. Uh, the second one is one of my favorites. I don't know if you guys have seen the Sea Biscuit. And the reason is, is because it's very motivational and it's based on a true story. Right? It's a horse that ran, injured, the jockey got injured, they, they solve their problem, they make it through, and they come out and remember. Um, so I think that if you can have elements from a film like that uh, to make it motivational, that it keeps it exciting. And then swagger and grit. Now, Armageddon is about the end of the world, but I'm going to ask this question in the room. Do you guys happen to remember what Bruce Willis's team did for full-time jobs before they got launched into space to drill a hole in an asteroid? Oil, they oil, oil decades. That's right, right. So here's the concept, right? Take guys that work on an oil rig, right, that have half the vocabulary of any of us, but can get it done. And if you ask me, or if you ask my grandfather, or my, my now past father, how this country got to be where it's at. It's probably a little bit of luck and a lot of hard work, but there's a lot of grit. And that's kind of the thing that we continue to miss. So have grit in this movie. I mean, the thing that I like, and I'll just preach for a second about Dr. Zubrin's entire pitch, is that everything that he has in his technology would work, in my opinion. Now, I'm not a NASA scientist. But he's not overcomplicating it, really. He's been saying the same thing since the early 90s, in some ways, for the architecture, right? So does it have to be such a scary story, or can we really just use some of the stuff that we have and make up the rest? But if we don't try and fail or try and succeed, how will we even know? So that's kind of the three elements that I think should be part of a Mars film. And I hope that my book, which is entitled Planet B, may make it that far. So where can we begin? I mean, if we're going to face this problem, what can we do? Well, I can tell you that I'm investing time in this as a creative to create a brand that I think um, will create some new possibilities. Because I think that as a person that sits not in an organization, uh, it's, a, it's an organization about Mars, I can tell any story, right? So I can talk about Mars One, I can talk about NASA, I can talk about JAXA, I can bring in information from about, about any source. But if I can put it all in one place and make it easy to access, and then I'm a smart marketer, and I push it to the people that don't know anything about Mars, and I say, it would be really great if some creative artists could pick up on this and start to turn it into some positive things. I bet you that snowball will continue to roll. And, and I know what, when it's going to roll is when a president or a leader of a country gets up in front of the rest of us and says, we are going to Mars, or we are doing something exciting at X and X date. That's when everyone's going to want to make money. That's when everyone's going to want to turn on the TV. And that's when everyone's going to care. Right? I say we don't have to wait for that message because I personally think that message is coming. But either way, let's just give positive hope. Right? All right. I don't know why it was.
use branding that audiences can relate to, so I think you gotta make it exciting. And so I've been exploring a lot of different brand concepts that I think would be easy to remember and understand. Um, to use the smarter recipes analogy, right? So keep it simple, right? I was calling this less sugar, more protein, make it tasty. Keep the movie exciting, keep it real, just drop out a lot of the stuff that is probably very unlikely or really boring or really scary. And, um, and again, continue to make space technology easier to understand for the non-technology clients because artists require a different type of input to stay interested. I have half and half of that brain and I can't tolerate some of this on the bell curve and I can't tolerate some of this on the bell curve, but being in the middle, it all seems to work well. On, on your first bullet on that, are you talking about a Mars Wikipedia? Well, I know someone that's actually putting together sort of a Mars encyclopedia, but even probably more than that, everything that I can find, including media. Now, in a way, I guess a Mars encyclopedia sort of is that, because you can have videos and music and everything else. That's well, I was saying Wikipedia lets contributions be made from a lot of places, and then they get verified and picked down. That's right. No, so you're exactly right. Wikipedia is kind of where I do a lot of my research, but you know, the one thing I always wonder with Wikipedia which is what I wonder on the rest of the internet, is if I shared half of that information with the guys that are sitting in the next room, how much of it's true, how much of it's false, how much of it's actually true, instead of, you know. So it's, how, is there anyone validating? So what I would like to do is put together sort of a board of real Mars people and say, is this really the ground temperature three off? You know, all those sorts of things. Verify the facts. Yeah, um, so um, we, we have a Mars encyclopedia called the Marspedia, and Mars Society is one of the Yeah, uh, on Wikipedia, I wrote most of the stuff on a geology there. You did? And it is mostly right. Good. There's a lot of information on Wikipedia about Mars. I did most of the geology, and uh, it, it keeps changing them. Right. So whatever the, everything you write today is going to be changed a month from now. So right. and it, is, it is new. It's one of the places you can put information in this new, instead of waiting for the, the process of uh, having a uh, peer review of articles and then getting them published and then getting them out into the general press. So Wikipedia is very new. Yeah, yeah. No one new information. My, my challenge is, and, and I give you all this task, go and Google all about Mars or Google Mars and you're going to get back, you know, 10,000 results. My whole point in case is, can we try to focus it into maybe one place? And maybe I'm barking up the wrong tree with it. But as a writer who is investigating it, who now is working at the Mars Society, right? I mean, that's how deep I had to get into it, what I felt was the right information. And I gotta tell you, I wrote that book for the most part up to about February, and half of it now is probably not as great as I wanted it to be, because I'm learning a lot in a short time. I think one good area to get our message across to the general public is to emphasize the spin-offs from the space program. Yes. That have enhanced our country because NASA yes. is forbidden from advertising. The moon mission, I understand, has paid for itself. And the Mars mission is starting to because of robot technology. Yes. Great point. It's a great point. If if you think of this is my my you're you're supporting exactly what I said from the standpoint of if you give, humans want a place to go, right? So I'm not gonna go down that path because I'm being flagged that I got less than 60 seconds here, but I, I couldn't agree with more. Um, am I going in the right order? I only have one more slide. I just wanted to drop a few more points on here. Since I have you guys for another 60 seconds. Wow. So much more time. Um, so, so where can you help? Well, all I was gonna say is if you have a job, where you know a lot about Mars. If someone calls you who's a creative person, is asking questions, or they're sending you an email, answer that email. That's the way to get back. Answer the phone call. Support creative entrepreneurs who want to do this and who want to take this space. Don't look at them as the people that just, you know, I don't know. I mean, we need the technologists and the engineers as much as we need the creatives because to make an entire culture, it takes all kinds, right? And to share your content and knowledge with as many people to get the chance to tutor a writer or tutor a young person, um, please do that. Uh, I just wanted to mention there's three titles out there. 
There's one in the next room I just learned about, again, a uh, children's book. Uh, there's uh, a docu-fiction sort of written about Mars in the future called Unearth. And then uh, one that I'm writing called Planet B, which I don't know when the heck it'll be out, but at some point I'll finish it when I have time. Thank you. Jill Robertson at the front desk found and some